right now we hear from um, President Gallagher, interim President Gallagher, Winston DeQueer, and Mary Warner. Ms. Warner, do you want to sit right here, please? And so <clears throat> we all know what has brought us here. So uh, President Gallagher, if you just want to jump right in, we would welcome that. Yeah, Chair, th thank you, thank you, and thank you all very much for having us today, and thank you most importantly for holding this uh, very, very important hearing. Um, I know you don't want folks to duplicate testimony, but I am going to du duplicate something that Commissioner uh, Hunter Reed said. What I want to do is offer an apology and all of LSU's apology to the survivors of domestic uh, and sexual violence on our campuses. We failed those who it was our first duty to protect. Um, it was an example of institutional betrayal. Senator Peterson, you asked for 10 cent words and I'm a lawyer and lawyers speak best with 10 cent words. Sad, painful, tragic, brutal, sickening. Um, I am ashamed. But I, while I'm ashamed, I'm also grateful to the survivors who bravely came forward to share their experiences with us. Everyone in our LSU family owes those courageous survivors a debt of gratitude because it's through their bravery and their strength that we're here today. Without that courage, there would have been no LSU-wide investigation. There would have been no Hush Blackwell report. There would have been no recommendations for change. There would have been no substantial contract with STAR to help us improve our training and Senator uh, Hewitt's C word, culture. So I am both very sorry and sad, but I'm also very grateful. Thank you to those survivors. Now, I know you want me to answer your questions, and I will answer your questions, um, but I do want to reiterate that in that Hush Blackwell report, there are 18 recommendations, um, I think beginning at about page 134, and we're going to implement absolutely each and every one of those recommendations. Uh, we've already begun creating a new Office of Civil Rights in Title IX that will not report to general counsel. Um, we're going to devote resources to hiring sufficient folks to, to staff that office. Um, we're going to improve our training. We're going to be clearer in our responsibilities. We're going to articulate clear punishments for faculty, staff, and students. Uh, and the 18th recommendation is this applies to everybody. We're going to hold everybody accountable. Uh, safety and sensitivity will be our, our hallmarks, and we will endeavor to change our culture. Now, let me shift to your questions. Um, on Act 172, and, and my friend Winston DeQueer can perhaps help me with this, um, we, we do have a system of confidential advisors that are in place. Uh, our, our Title IX coordinator did take the lead along with uh, Baton Rouge Community College, Southern in, uh, in Baton Rouge, and LSU in drafting an MOU with law enforcement uh, off, uh, officials about investigation protocols, information sharing, training, and more. Um, law enforcement has verbally agreed to that. I don't think they've ever signed it. Um, now, how you asked, how does the institution handle complaints about sexual misconduct? Um, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, yes. It's Senator to myself. Yeah, <laughs> yes. We all have that same <laughs> look. You just took my breath away. Yeah. So law enforcement has verbally agreed, but not signed, signed it. it. So, I mean, really, that's insulting on so many levels. I, I, I mean, I, I really, we're playing a game. This has become, we're playing a game that we're all taking seriously, but the people who can make the difference, that, no offense, I, I know you're here to answer it, and God bless you for taking the arrows because uh, if we had 10 other people, we'd still be doing the same thing. But well, I, do you hear how ridiculous that sounds I, when you read it? Before you it? answer, I, I absolutely do. Yep. What, what law enforcement is this? Yeah, what, uh, what, what branch of law enforcement? The draft, is this? The draft MOU, mm -hmm. it was one document that the three universities within Baton Rouge were going to sign. Mm -hmm. the sheriff's office, BRPD, and the DA's office. So no one has signed from those entities? No, no. And, and, and we, Next and, and meeting. My, myself and the president, 
only having been there about a year and a month, both I had to research where this cog came up in the process, and only in the last couple of days because of this committee hearing did I dig and determine that our office had actually drafted an MOU and, and in the law enforcement approval process is where it got held up. And did so they respond? Did they reach? I, I wasn't part of those conversations. I, I'm going off what the folks in my Title IX office who put the MOU together told me about why it was never executed. So how long ago was this? I talked to my Title IX office about this about two days ago and yesterday. How long had the police department had it? The okay. MOU was drafted in 2019. 2019? Are you serious? And you talk about a culture? What culture? Uh, you know, I'm just so, so incredibly disappointed. But, so but this is the information I was provided. But we, we understand. We saw it. We were just couple, so caught off guard. I was, I was trying to research where was this document within LSU, and, and I actually reached out. It was Southern's general counsel reached out to me because she was new also, and we collectively dug in our files and determined that the universities, including BRCC, had put a draft MOU together, and it had just never been executed. Hold on, hold on, hold on, Representative Davis. You on? You where you are? On. No, no. Okay, thank you, thank you, um, President Galligan and uh, Mr. DeQueer for being here. I appreciate it. Um, just to follow up on that, have y'all haven't heard back? at all from them? I know you have a I, verbal, but but so what does that even mean? I didn't participate okay. in the conversations. Because that was 2019. This, this, yeah, this was me in the process of preparing for this hearing, running through a checklist. And with, you found with, this MOU yeah, in your file. Shared and, this, actually they shared the MOU with me and said we had put this together. Gotcha. Yeah. When you say they, that meaning the university. Yeah, yeah, the three universities, the three universities. had agreed to the language and they had never gotten an agreement from law enforcement. I, I don't know who would have been, I can't make any representations as to who would have been involved or who okay. was negotiating. This was what was told to me when I was trying to dig into where this agreement was. So is the plan to now follow up with? Yes, most okay. definitely, most definitely. Um, following up on our Hush Blackwell report, we actually have some real work to do with our own police department, and part of that I had intended to complete this. And is too. the LSU Police Department a part of that? I know you said the there, DA, the sheriff, there, and the... They're yeah. a different entity. Um, our LSU Police Department needs to be, as a university department, needs to be more integrated with Title IX. Mm -hmm. We can't integrate outside police departments the same way because our LSU Police Department doesn't have to deal with FERPA issues if they share information with LSU. Got it. That, that's a different issue with outside departments. So yeah. we, we have that and we will be fixing that in very short order. And just a request, whenever y'all do make that request to the Sheriff's Department and the DA's office and the uh, Baton Rouge Police that you let us know when that's happened and give us and keep us up to date on it because I think that we'll be very interested to find that out. Okay. Thank you. So, um, how how does the institution handle sexual complaints against sexual misconduct? Um, it, when it involves students, it's handled through our Title IX office, and these com these complaints can be made verbally or through our 800 number or online. Uh, when a complaint is made, it's assigned to an investigator who interviews witnesses, evaluates the evidence, and prepares an investigative report. Um, the next step is a hearing conducted by a panel and the leader of the panel, it's a three-person panel, is a professional administrative law judge. Um, the, the panel can impose sanctions and there's the right to appeal to the Title IX coordinator. Um, the implementation of hearings with the administrative law judge is new. Um, that began this fall and it significantly streamlined the hearing process. There's only one hearing wherein responsibility and discipline are determined. Uh, then there's one appeal to the Title IX coordinator. Um, in the past, there were multiple levels and multiple investigations, which, which uh, can be incredibly invasive and, and, and re-victimizing. So we've changed that this fall. Um, we also this fall have clarified, and, and we're actually going to do it again this week, that, that unless you're a confidential advisor, everybody is a mandatory person. Everybody is a responsible person. Every complaint must be submitted to Title IX, regardless of what department initially receives it. So that's for students. 
for employees, the executive director of our equal employment office within HR handles the complaints of harassment. So human resources would interview witnesses, they'd review evidence, and at the conclusion, both parties are provided a copy, an outcome of the investigation, and any proposed discipline is provided in writing to the employee, uh, and civil service employees would be issued discipline in accordance with Louisiana civil service rules. We have a flowchart. Um, I think we've made that available to you, or we certainly could. The flowchart was new again this fall. Um, when w w Title IX and General Counsel's Office this summer redrafted our Title IX guidelines and created the flowchart. You asked about missteps, um, and the most serious misstep, and this is noted in the Hush Blackwell report, is failing to report by employees when they, when they, they don't, either they didn't understand they were responsible or they, they didn't comply with the regulation. That's the most serious misstep. Um, another misstep is, is, or was, I hope, failure to keep students properly apprised of the process and what's going on, which is perceived as delay or inaction. Um, another possible misstep and misstep is, is it helps a student to report the conduct to the police but don't report the same conduct to Title IX because reporting to the police is not reporting to Title IX. Um, another potential misstep is failing to quickly intervene or take other appropriate intermediate measures. How can the process be convoluted? Um, I've already described prior to August 2020, there were multiple levels, there were multiple potential investigations. In other words, there'd be investigation by Title IX, there'd be investigation by, by the student accountability folks. There could be multiple layers of appeal, and we have streamlined that process. Um, an, another po possible convolution in the process is if there's, if there's not Title IX jurisdiction and the matter then would go to student uh, accountability instead of Title IX. Um, having the police, as, as, as Winston has already um, noted, having the police report all domestic and sexual violence matters to the Title IX office um, did not always occur, and that is occurring now. Uh, athletics had an administrator to oversee gender issues under Title IX, you know, the Title IX with the, the, and that immediately created confusion because Title IX and teams, members, Title IX, sexual and domestic violence. So that created confusion. Um, that person was also the very same person to whom athletics had incorrectly told athletic employees to report Title IX sexual and domestic violence matters. So we, we've changed the title and we've changed that whole process. And as I said before, we've clarified, you report to, if it's a matter of sexual or domestic violence, you report to the Title IX office. Variables in the process. Um, D discovering that a, a alleged perpetrator isn't an enrolled student or no longer a member of the campus community is a variable. H having a survivor change their mind about wanting to pursue an investigation is a potential variable. Justifiably change their mind, perhaps. Having survivors who are justifiably, most justifiably afraid that a respondent might know their identity or the fact that they even made a complaint. These are things that have to be dealt with with sensitivity, and we have to get better at that. Um, our current regulations require that respondents be afforded uh, full due process and the right to cross-examine witnesses. This is, comes from the, the Trump Department of Education um, new regulations under Title IX. Um, that, can make, uh, that can make a survivor reluctant to come forward because they know they're going to face cross-examination. Um, how, how often is the process reviewed and updated? Our first Title IX policy was June 2014. Um, then in 2015, Title IX policy was revived in response to changes in the state law that we've been talking about. And then in August 2020, the policy underwent a major revision in response to changes in Title IX regulations adopted in May of 2020. And those are the regulations that we're operating under, uh, operating under right now. I'll anticipate two questions. First, um, women in leadership. 
Um, Representative Hughes, we have one of our seven chancellors is a woman. Um, the, uh, I will add our provost and executive vice president is a woman. Interim Executive Vice President of Financial Affairs and Administration is a woman, and our Interim Vice President of Civil Rights and Title IX is a woman. Um, General Counsel is an African-American male, um, but only two of our 16 supervisors are, are women. Um, my, my General Counsel is writing me a note. Oh, the Dean of the Law School is a woman. Yeah, the Interim Dean of the Law School, thank you. Um, and uh, I know Senator Cloud's not with us now, but uh, we make the information uh, available to participants in, in the process. They, they do receive that information. And the, the level of what's released for an employee or for a student matter basically are the same thing. The only thing with an employee is we might have some hesitation if the matter involved a student complaining against an employee uh, about something and we were worried that the employee might be able to find out who that student was. We, we might then not provide all of the information to the employee about, about the matter. Other than that, we basically provide all the same information. So I thank you and, and Senator Mizell, I'm not St. Sebastian, but I will answer any questions and take any arrows that are shot. Thank you. Um, President Gallagher, first of all, I, I do want to say thank you for your leadership and thank you for the level of transparency um, that you guys have participated in with the report, um, with the Hush Blackwater report. We, we appreciate that. And I appreciate the fact that you come here today and that you've offered a testimony, um, offered an apology publicly to those individuals who have been betrayed by the system. Um, but I, I do, because that's the first part of healing when you're going through a trauma is that someone acknowledges it and they apologize and take ownership of it. And so I appreciate that. But as it relates to those individuals who are and have been victimized, you, you know, have you, have you guys done that with those people? Have you apologized to them to some degree, um, either through letter I mean, you just did it here publicly with us, but you have acknowledged that the system failed them and have y'all apologized to them, even though, um, and it doesn't have to be anything grand other than letting them know that they've been heard, you apologize, and they are going to get their justice. Yeah, I do, I do apologize to them, um, okay. and I apologize to everybody in the LSU community, um, and and. I, I would actually welcome the opportunity to apologize to each and every one of them in person. Um, I, I don't want to be, I, I, and I don't want them to reach out to me, but I also want to respect their privacy. And, mm -hmm. and, but but, but I, I would say to each and every one of them, please, if, if, you, if you're willing, email, come by. I, I, I want to apologize. I'm sitting in this chair. So, so I, I, I may not have been in the chair when the, things happen, but I'm sitting in the chair today, so it, it, it is my responsibility to apologize, and, and I do. Um, I will say, I know you didn't ask me this, but um, the first call I made when I read the USA Today article was to Star, um, because I knew we had a relationship with Star. I knew that Star did great work. So I called Star and I said, I, I need help. How can you help us with this? And we've subsequently contracted with STAR um, to come in and do a, a significant review of all of our training for faculty, staff, and students. We, we do do training. We actually have some pretty significant training, but we want to look at it all and see how can we improve it. That'll be year one of the work. And going forward, what, what we really want to get them to help us with is our, is our culture, is how can we get to where it's our culture that you don't do this. Or if you hear about it, you, you can't sleep at night until you report it, because that's the culture. Um, and on Hush Blackwell, even though I'd called Star, I, I, I went in probably the next day and went to Winston and I said, Winston, we, we, we can't do this on our own. Um, we, we, can, we can try to do this on our own, but we've tried to do this on our own at LSU before in, internally and, and not getting help. We need somebody to come in and do this. 
So we brought Hush, Bla Hush Blackwell in, and from the beginning, we, we've made it clear to everybody that their report is going to be public. It, we're going to share this report, and I'm going to steal from Jim Henderson. I actually texted somebody while he was speaking and said he stole my line. <laughs> We need sunlight on this. We need the help of our community to fix this. If we didn't share that report, we're not getting all the help that we need. So, so that's why we shared that report. I don't think LSU's ever done anything like that in the past. So I appreciate you. I appreciate you. So thank you. Okay. Well, thank you again. I, I do appreciate that. And we do have uh, plenty of questions. So we're going to start with uh, Representative Hughes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll get the easy things out the way. Um, President Gallagher, um, I know you inherited a lot of problems, and so thank you for your leadership. Um, really quickly, system-wide, how many, what's the total student population? I think it's about 51,000. And percentage of women? Ooh, it's, it's over 50%. Yeah, women are the majority. Um, you, you already put on record that uh, one out of seven of your campus leaders, women, and only two board members out of the statutorily required 16. I just want to put this in perspective. Um, when we look at the LSU system, the UL system, and the Southern University system, so let's take LCTCS out for a minute. We have a total of 21 campus leaders. And out of 21, only one is a woman. That is absolutely shameful in 2021. We basically have a sign on these campuses that say women need not apply. And out of all four systems, we have a total of 65 supervisors and only 15 are women. That is absolutely shameful. No wonder the culture is so messed up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Hughes. Yeah. Senator Peterson. Uh, yeah, we need more women everywhere, Representative Hughes. Again, um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Gallagher. Yes. Galligan, Mr. Galligan, thank you. That Mr. You don't want to be a doctor? No, I'm a, uh, I'm a lawyer, so. That, yeah, that just, that, that Juris Doctorate. Remember that last I, I, No, I know, I know, I know, but the ABA, <laughs> the ABA used to say, Senator, you, we shouldn't call ourselves doctor, and I'm 65, so I'm still living under those old ABA rules, so. Well, when I was in law school with Winston, he called himself a doctor once he graduated. <laughs> Tulane, and that was Tulane, not LSU, by the way. I'm going to out you right here. You're a Tulane law grad. Yeah, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, he's an LSU law grad. Oh. My Are former you really? student. Yes. You're confusing right. me with our other friend. Oh, my, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. I'm so I know sorry. You, I know who you I'm putting you. I'm putting you in the wrong school. I was, all right, I'll take it back. Mea culpa. Um, <laughs> so I'm, so, I'm sorry about that. But no, seriously, there's one word that, is resonating has been since this report came out in my mind and I think a lot of people accountability and so I'd ask you the question simply where has the accountability been for those people involved and what does that look like well we've we've we have disciplines we have disciplined two folks um, who are currently at at the university uh, we suspended one person for 30 days without pay and another person for 21 days without pay. Um, going forward, we're going to have clear, there was, there was, Senator, there was no culture of punishment at LSU. There was no notice at the time as to what would happen. Uh, the policies were very unclear. There, there were directions within departments to report Title IX issues to places they should not have been reported. Yeah, but there, don't there, we live in an at-will state? There, we do. There was. I, I mean, I know I do know this about you. You're an employment lawyer. Yes. All right. And so I'm just gonna say, like, we live in an at-will state. We have a report, right? And my question is, do you think that is sufficient? Do you think that that it, both of you? Do you think it's sufficient accountability? for what you read? I, I don't know if it's sufficient. I know that w what I was trying to do was to be as fair as I possibly could. To whom? G to everybody. Mm -hmm. G given given the, the report and the history, 
I would say, and I know this, going forward, we're going to make the consequences clear. So, so you say you're going to make the consequences clear. Do you think that the action was egregious? I think the action was egregious. If you think the action was egregious, notwithstanding the fact that there weren't clear, uh, as you're doing moving forward prospectively, clear guidelines, if you do this, then this happens, right? There are things that rise to the level of shocking your conscience. conscience. And there comes a responsibility with certain positions that if uh, th th there are consequences in um, if you don't do it, then you don't have what we've been talking about is the trust. And so, you know, 21, and, and look, I, I, know, I know some of the people involved. I know them and I know some of the good work they did, mm -hmm. right? Um, but notwithstanding that, there are a lot of people that are counting on you, Mr. Gallagher to get this right and to and, and and I'm just asking you I wanted to really know if you think that what you've done at this point is sufficient to earn and garner the trust of the students, the faculty and the public. Do you think 21 days, you know, unpaid uh suspension and 30 days unpaid suspension is adequate to garner the trust moving forward? I, I don't know if it's adequate to garner the trust. Um, as I said before, I, w I was trying to be as fair as I possibly could to everyone. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I have to, we have to garner the trust by everything that we do. Um, and so I'm, I'm sure if that was a mistake that I will, I will probably make other mistakes, but I, I No, need... I'm not saying you made a mistake. No, no, I'm I... just saying if, if I did that, I, I, I will need the community's support, so I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. There's a lot more we have to do to build trust. But there's no more information you need based on the actions that occurred, right? Because you did, there are things that occurred, there were allegations made, you now have a report, and your response to that report were two suspensions. It wasn't to fire anyone. So I, su I assume it's 21 days is almost up, and 30 days they'll be back on the job doing the thing they were doing before. Correct. That's that's correct. Now, and so those two people, or it's two people. Yes. Will be back on the job, and so then everything goes back in place. But you now have some new rules in place. So if they do it again, then there'll be consequences. Is that fair assessment? Of that, what? that is a fair assessment. And you're I, okay with that? I I'm I'm okay with that as long as they clearly understand, and we all clearly understand, and I think we do now what our responsibilities are. You didn't think they on, think thought they had a responsibility to tell the truth? I think they... Because this is the essence of it. I don't want to tap dance around this. We keep talking about fidelity. They didn't tell the truth in the role that they had, and there were young people that were harmed by it, permanently harmed, because they were sexually assaulted and no one listened. And so you want to say fidelity is going to be the model moving forward. Well, we found out fidelity, which is something that I suspect when they took the job, both of them, that they were expected to tell the truth, certainly to their bosses, to comply with regulations. They didn't tell the truth. And when you don't tell the truth, you can make a mistake. I made mistakes in my life. Lord knows I've made mistakes in my life. But one thing I'm not going to do is lie. Well, and they I, didn't tell the truth. Yes, they did not. They did not disclose. They, they did. Come on, come on. No, no, no. That's we tapped it. No, they didn't I, tell the truth. I, well, I, I, I'm not tap dancing. I think they didn't disclose. What's the difference? And, well, the difference is very, very. Maybe I'm not tap dancing. I mean, I'm a lawyer. You're lawyer. Like, what's the of difference lawyers. between not disclosing and not telling the truth? Well, it's. I would say making a falsehood. It's as opposed to not saying, okay, disclose but I, falsehood. Did they tell the truth? They did not tell the truth. Okay, now we're on the same page. Now, they didn't tell the truth. And, I and wanna, the consequences for not telling the truth is merely a suspension. And you get to come back on the job and maybe not tell the truth again? If they don't tell the truth again, they'll be terminated. And there we go. That's what I'm saying. If they didn't tell the truth and we're in an at-will state, it's our, uh, it's our subjective decision, when I say our government, yeah. the board, 
the board and LSU gets to decide what the consequences are for not telling the truth. And if you all are okay with that, not telling the truth, and that this is the appropriate um, you know, penalty or enforcement action, if that's what we're good with, I just that's what I needed to know. And and I thank you, Madam Chair. I, I am I'm I'm not good with that. I'm not good with not telling the truth under any circumstances. But I I would add that they were both in an environment where the the messages from the top were very, very unclear. The messages from, from the top okay. were the messages from the top were in fact that there was no punishment for this. Yeah, because there the messages no from the top, and you weren't there, neither of you were there at the time of this, but the messages from the top, was it okay? It was okay not to tell the truth. That's right. And it's not okay. It was okay, but it's they said that. And so just because everybody in the entire hierarchy was okay with the lies, I mean, the entire system, academic and athletic, were okay with everybody lying. And the people that were harmed were students. And this is what I'm saying. There are no, there may have been one, and I may have missed it, maybe one woman, and y'all correct me, in this process of the lies. The whole compadre of people telling lies. There may have been one woman. Or is there any woman? Is there any woman involved at that level? No? There, there's, there's one woman who did not disclose, as okay. you say, tell yeah. lies. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's what I'm saying. There's all, of all of these people, but still, all of these people are not telling the truth. And we're okay with that because everybody gets to just move on with a new set of roles. Yeah, At I'm, the end of the day, that's what we're talking about. Well, I'm, I'm not okay with that. You I'm are, not, you I'm, are okay. I'm, no, I'm not. I'm okay with the punishment that what I imposed. Um, but I'm not okay moving forward. Uh, oh, moving forward, I'm, I'm gonna, we're gonna change things. But if you don't have consequences and strong consequences for the, the, the action, then it, it doesn't serve as a deterrent. And people think that they can still do it. Yeah. Senator yeah. Peterson. Yeah, help one, me once. One, one of the one of the very difficult and this is the employment lawyer in me talking. And and I normally don't share How about give me the father? <laughs> give me the father of a daughter. Put yes, the you employment know I do have a put daughter. the employment it, daughter. It, Father of a daughter, give me that one. This was, and I'll, I could put it in fatherly terms. At some point, we had to decide whether you view it as a parent with a kid or as an administrator over a school, where we were going to draw the line and say, this is now the rule. The problem is no one had drawn that line in the mm. sand. And we were faced with a difficult, difficult decision of having to impose discipline where nobody had drawn the line saying hmm. do not cross. And that's where we were. Hmm. And so what we were trying to do is be fair in imposing discipline and simultaneously mm -hmm. clearly drawing a line that should have been drawn a long time ago. And is, that's, where, that's where disciplinary decisions get very, very difficult because you're holding people to rules that weren't made explicitly clear. But I'm saying it's not only about those rules, Winston and Mr. And Mr. DeQueer and Mr. Gallagher. It is about just telling the truth. I understand, and I don't disagree not about with all, you. Because the set of rules, it's always should have been in place that you tell the truth in your job and to the yeah. hierarchy and to the people that you serve, that you tell the truth. That should have been fundamental and be fair. And that didn't happen. We also had another report. Thank you, Madam Chair. We, we also, Senator, had another report that said no one should be disciplined, a previous report. So that was the whole context of the decision. Which report was that? It was a 2018 report, 2019 report by a law firm named Morgan Lewis. And the report said that no one should that, be punished. Yes. No wonder we have these issues. I, I, I I agree with um, Senator Peterson. I, I'm just so, uh, now. I feel like um, Senator Hewitt. I mean, I was already frustrated, but now I feel like my blood is beginning to boil, and and and, and I feel somewhat insulted um, by. It, it, I feel. I, 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 let me just stop there because I am very frustrated at this point, uh, Senator Mizell. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a few things. Um, uh, technically, on the process, when when you said um, uh, the complainant uh, can verbally with an 800 number or go online, who who answers the 800 number? Who who's there to answer the phone when a complaint is we, made? We have a professional service that answers the calls 24-7. As, at, and what do they call them? I mean, they're, they're a, the Title actually, IX extension? Uh, it, it's actually called Ethics Point is the company, and they prepare an email that goes to the appropriate department. So if you call and you allege a Title IX problem 2 o'clock in the morning, they prepare an email and send it to the Title IX coordinator. But they're the, not going to call it a Title IX problem. You know, people people well, who well, are in that situation if you, if you, are if not going to say. No, if it refers to sexual misconduct as right. opposed to you call in and you say, I, my supervisor's stealing money, that would go to audit. And they send it in and we handle it in-house. So it's just a general uh, hotline that filters yes. calls to everything. Yes. It's not a dedicated line for sexual assault or, or uh, problems no, like that. You can call the Title IX office directly for that, but if you call uh, after, at all hours, no, the Title IX office would be open during normal business hours. Right. Ethics no. Point would would handle everything after Title IX closes. So have you all remedied that? Do you, does that sound like a problem to you? Because it sounds like a problem to me. That, that if somebody had called at midnight. We, we actually haven't had any complaints about folks calling the 800 Probably number. don't know how to get to you to give you a complaint. There. <laughs> Senator, we, we collect a lot of complaints from our 800 number. Okay, well, a, a the other thing, the um, I, I had a, a colleague text me and she wants to know why money was not moved from the football funding toward uh, resources for Title IX. And um, has that even been discussed? Has that, do you all see that as an untouchable source that are? are no, not at all. no, we don't see that as an untouchable source at all. Um, and I would add though that the report also concludes that this isn't just an athletics issue. This is a campus No, it's not an issue. athletics issue, but that seems to be where the money's going. Yeah. Okay. And and if, while I, if you don't mind, uh, Madam okay, Chair, okay. I, I would I would I, we haven't heard from the woman with the university, and uh, Mary Werner, I believe. Could you give us? Uh, I don't want you to talk literally out of school, but I'd really like to know if conversations took place in, in the uh, to discuss where we are today. Uh, Thank that, you. That there was, yeah. Could Senator, you, could if you I, share if I could inter introduce myself so that I can put my role in perspective for okay. everyone. Some of you in the room know me and some do not. I'm Mary Werner, um, a member of the Board of Supervisors at LSU, one of the two women on the LSU Board of Supervisors, um, and I represent the 3rd Congressional District from Southwest Louisiana. Mm -hmm. I'm the past, immediate past chairman of the Board of Supervisors. So I served um, at the end of the last administration and, in, and invited uh, Dr. Galligan to serve as our interim president. So that kind of puts me in the timeline of leadership. And also I wanted to come today to um, let you all see a face of a woman um, that represents LSU. This is an exceeding, we have been through a lot over the last few months. Um, a lot of self-reflection while this investigation has gone on. Many conversations, many meetings, all gut-wrenching. Um, every word that's been used today. But I wanted to come because I knew there might be questions at the supervisory level. Constitutionally, we are given managerial authority. However, we are actually supervisors, and we could go into all educational policy on another day about how that actually works. Mm -hmm. But President Galligan and Mr. DeQueer have been very intentional in bringing the leadership of the board, the current chair, Mr. Damp, the chair-elect, Mr. Starnes, and myself into these conversations and meetings all along as information was discovered throughout this report. It is heartbreaking. I am the mother of a student at LSU, a male, and my 17-year-old bright-eyed, beautiful, blue-eyed daughter is on her way to LSU this fall and couldn't be more excited, mm -hmm. but has spent the last few nights at my kitchen counter pouring over my copy of the Hush Blackwell report. Mm -hmm. Now, 
I hate that, that my beautiful 17-year-old has done that, but I am very grateful that it has caught her attention out of her little bubble of her high, safe high school that she realizes what women and men that she will go to school with have been through, and it has you know, opened her eyes as to what the world looks like and what she has to protect herself from. Mm -hmm. So that's as an introduction. Um, I'm happy to answer any specific questions. I sit here as a supervisor member, not as an employee of LSU, um, but I wanted to come and offer myself and my perspective if you all had questions for me. Uh I think what I'd really like to know, and I don't know if it's something you could share with us, but I know President Gallagher was forthcoming and saying that uh, they they uh, felt that the uh, suspensions were fair discipline, and that now it's in policy that that, that there could be a, a, a termination with what we saw take place. Did that come before the board? Did you all discuss that as what where you were going with that, and how did you arrive at the outcome that? Well, it, that is a decision of the of the management of the university, which uh, though constitutionally it says management, that is actually the role of the president. Um, and he did inform the board leadership of those decisions. Um, let me say that knowing what we have known through reading the investigation and hearing these reports, what Mr. DeQueer and Mr. Galligan were saying that we now are expected to hold people accountable to a rule that didn't exist. I have also read the myriad of memos and had conversations through with other, with the previous administration, what the tone was, the culture, as Senator Hewitt so mm -hmm. well put it. Mm -hmm. um, and when I look at it from that issue, I'm very conflicted as well. But I also know that not setting a standard right or wrong and in this case wrong, that there was not a clear line of how reporting happened, who it went to, that, and it has confounded me that people I have a lot of respect for and an administration that, some, that have a tremendous amount of experience, meaning in the athletic department, previous administration, current administration in the athletic department, previous LSU administration, current LSU administration, um, could overlook such specifics and be and conflict their employees as they did. That does not, Senator, excuse not telling the truth and protecting students. And I want to be clear about that. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to talk out of both sides of my mouth, and I hope you don't think I am. Um, but it does put us all, if you discipline an employee on a policy that did not exist, that puts us in a very difficult position. And what does that do to the new policy? We have come out, we came out strong on Friday. Here we are, these are the new policies. Um, our title, new Title IX off, Office of Diversity in Title IX was set to open sometime this week. They were on the job first thing Monday morning because as I walked in today to the LSU offices before I came over here, I want to know where are we on Wednesday. I want to know. Um, I want my fellow board members to know and have the accountability of where we go every day going forward. But I, I think the, the, the real confusion in my mind is that what policy was it in place that would justify lying? Or, or what, what policy was not in place that justified not protecting the victims? Because that, that, I'm at a loss for that. I've never had a job anywhere that would not have terminated me for lying at, right, at work and not protecting the people that I was there to protect. And, and there, and we, I, we could go back to the mandatory reporters I mean, that, 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 it's just, it, it's a slap in the face of the term mandatory reporter. But, I mean, I, I know you're, you're here and I appreciate it, but this, I don't think this is satisfactory on any level. And, and I, you know, I'm, I'm getting texts to uh, find out about this. But so far, it's just really disappointing because it's like we're all taking it very seriously. But the system is finding a way to uh, protect the status quo. And that's, that's what we, I, I guarantee you, the victims are not going to understand the explanation if we can sit here and not understand it. And that's who we have the debt to. So I, I hear you. I don't think we are protecting the status quo. I think we are very serious, and this president is very serious about making serious change. 
Right. And, and it, looking and at a university across seven campuses uh, this, across the state, Shreveport to Baton Rouge Health Science Center, New Orleans, mm -hmm. everywhere we go, um, that this, it, we are very high, we are focused on Baton Rouge A&M and absolutely Just an enormous fire, amount of problems. Right. right. Exactly. But we also have to institute the change across the LSU system right. as well. Right. And, and I hear you all and I am conflicted and troubled and want to have accountability. Like I said, walking in on Monday morning, on Tuesday morning, we had this press conference on Friday. We heard from one of the victims on Friday. President Galligan has made that invitation to speak to all of them. I would do the same as a member of the Board of Supervisors. I'm not the chair and I don't want to supersede the chair. We're very cautious about mm -hmm. that. He's out of the state. So I'm here in his place today. Um, so I cannot speak for him on that mm -hmm. matter. Mm -hmm. But we are trying to make a fresh start at LSU this week, Monday morning. Well, and, and I think we all appreciate that. But at this point, it's a lot of words. It's just a lot of words. And I think we, we're waiting to see action and commitment. And I, I office, think we're all committed to make sure that happens. Absolutely. With the new office that has been opened um, to take Title IX out of the general counsel's office, to clarify within athletics and every department to make sure we were focused on the athletics issues, but this has to be, you know, arts and sciences. Um, in the, the Dean of Education's office, everywhere, uh, the Chancellor of LSUE, every department across all the LSU campuses, including athletics, which is sensational, pervasive, um, you know, in the height of our attention here in the city of Baton Rouge, we have to make sure that we are doing this across. And, and I stand with you that we want action. Like I said, I walked in this morning before I dared to come up here to speak to you all, mm -hmm. that I want to know, okay, we reported on Friday. It's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, right. where are we? And, our, and the new office being opened, moving the Title IX, making sure we have the resources to put the appropriate investigators in the office so that all those call and the, and, and the system working with STAR, um, as I stated on Friday, we're very fortunate in the state of Louisiana, as Dr. Hendis, Henderson has said, LSU has said to have that organization and make sure we're utilizing those resources and letting students and employees know how to reach those resources. And, and I appreciate it. I, I just hope you all stay for the rest of the meeting and listen to the other side because we've all heard LSU for a long time. Mm -hmm. I think w we need to put this in context. So agree. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Mazel. Um, well put. Representative Fireberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and thank you, President Gallagher and, and uh, Mr. Uh, DeQueer and uh, former chair, uh, Ms. Warner. I too am to use your words, conflicted and confused. Uh, I watched the Board of Supervisors meeting last week. I watched the response that you gave to the press after the meeting. I listened to all the questions that were asked. And the one thing that disturbed me about the whole report was just what Senator Peterson brought up earlier. Yeah. Title IX is the stopping point where, where people ought to be able to get some justice in this system. And Title IX office failed so many. They swept, literally swept it under the carpet. Now, I know one of the individuals uh, personally that, that you have suspended. Wonderful, wonderful person. But that person also failed. Uh, and I am, to say that the rules didn't exist, Title IX rules existed. I don't understand how that could have been unclear to the coordinator of Title IX. I don't know how that could have been unclear to the person in the athletic department either. I, I, it, it, we talk about protecting the status quo. In, in a way, I feel like what the Board of Supervisors did by what I would consider a slap on the hand was also just putting it back under the carpet and saying, okay, we're going to start afresh. We're going to start anew. Uh, all of us are new in our jobs. We, we didn't, you know, this started in 2013. You mentioned 2013, 2014, 2018, report after report. I, I don't understand how we didn't know, and I don't understand how we're so confused. And um, 
uh, again, I, I, I heard your justification um, for things, but I just, I, I'm having a very difficult time as a member of this community trying to understand um, the justification. And I, I would, Representative Freiberg, I would say that look at the, I know you've looked at the report, but the, the confusion was absolutely rampant. It, it isn't clear, when, when you look at the section on the report, and I think Scott Schneider, the, the Hush Blackwell attorney who was the lead on preparing the report is gonna join us. Um, when you look at the section on training, I, I came back to LSU in 2016. I knew I, ha I knew I had a responsibility to report. So I, I've never had any doubt, but when I went back and I looked at the stuff, I looked at the words in the policy, I looked at the training, I looked at the different ways things were expressed, it wasn't clear. I led a faculty meeting at the Law Center as Dean of the Law Center where we talked about exactly this, and at least two-thirds to three-quarters of the faculty disagreed that that's what the report said. Um, but two-thirds of the th faculty w were not your Title IX coordinator. No, no, but they didn't understand, the employees didn't understand what their obligation was. Our Title IX coordinator ha had one, one Title I IX coordinator. The investigators for a long period of time, they did a good job, I think, the report indicates, but they were volunteers. They were people who had other jobs and they volunteered to do training. Our Title IX coordinator went and asked to hire additional investigators. The, the folks decided, administration decided they'd hire a lead investigator, one, one, lead. It took 19 months to hire that person. In the meantime, in various places, various leaders, various chief administrators were telling people, don't report Title IX to Title IX, report it to me, or report Title IX violations to this person who was not the Title IX coordinator. So, so the, confusion, the confusion was truly system-wide. So the Title IX coordinator only answers to the president of the university? They don't have any federal connections they, as a they, Title IX coordinator? No, they don't have federal connections. And at the time they reported to general counsel, um, that, that in and of itself is a conflict of interest because general counsel's job, thank you Winston, is to protect the institution. Um, Title IX's job is to do an independent investigation. It's not to protect the institution. In fact, what Title IX may well do is, is turn up things that, that are damaging to the institution, but we need to, they need to come out. But Title IX was reporting to the person who's supposed to protect the institution. The Dear Colleague letter that came out in the Obama administration and subsequent guidelines have all said, watch out, be careful, that that, that can be a conflict of interest. So, so, so the Title IX, again, and again, another example of middle management person, really, I mean, I, I'll use a business term, um, is reporting to a vice president and there's an inherent conflict of interest there. So that was another problem. But help me clarify, I thought there were instances where it never went past the Title IX or never went past the LSU uh, administrator uh, the, and to a higher, re, and, and where that person swept it under the rug. Representative Feiberg, our big problem was complaints not getting to Title IX, people trying to handle complaints themselves without invoking our Title IX office. But that, Title IX did get some of them. Yes, Title IX got a lot of them. In fact, um, uh, statistics are we average between 100 and 130 Title IX complaints a year. Um, we, we get quite a few. But what, what was happening is folks were not reporting them to Title IX, but reporting them to other people and in some circumstances, even other people thought they were doing the right thing by referring them to the police, and they'd never get to Title IX for adjudication. You know, our real flaw was units across campus were siloed, and then Title IX was siloed over in an administration building, and we were really having a problem capturing our Title IX complaints in a process we had set up. It wasn't a matter of 
you know, policies, like Senator Peterson said, it was a matter of us enforcing what we had on campus. So did anyone ever ask the Title IX person why um, she didn't resign because uh, she's not being heard or helped or? If you, if you review the beginning of the, it's about a third the way in, they actually, the Hush Blackwell report actually has a pretty good assessment of a presentation the Title IX coordinator gave to the administration maybe three, four months after she was hired. I'll have to go back hired. and read that because I have not read that section. Maybe three or four months after she was hired, and it's an attachment in the back, presenting an outline as to she was one person for 50000 I understand. She presented a pretty good presentation on what she needed to build out an effective office, and Hush Blackwell highlights the fact that nothing No, I, I know that, she, that everyone feels the office is not large enough. I'm just talking about when you get these complaints and they're not heard and nothing's done, how can you do your job? When you say when you, she wasn't getting the complaints, that that was the problem. But I thought she did get some complaints. She did get some. Some of them, some of them had some problems in processing. Um, when I say processing, they had flaws in the investigation, flaws in the outcome flaws in not contacting enough witnesses. There, there were a myriad of problems, and many of them that were investigated, but there were far larger problems in the ones that never even had an investigation start. Okay, I guess that's it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Fibert. Representative Davis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm really just trying to wrap my head around all of this, actually. Um, I'm sitting here and looking at my colleagues and like Re Represent uh, Senator Barrow said and Senator Hewitt, I'm gonna take this off since I'm six feet from everybody, it's easier to, to talk. Um, I'm just, uh, I'm kind of just dumbfounded. Um, I'm sad, I'm disgusted, I'm so disappointed in LSU and I continue to be disappointed in the response that we're getting right now and uh, my heart is beating really quickly and I'm shaking because it's just not enough. It's just, as a mother, and you guys know, I have a 20 year old daughter who is a senior at Auburn. And I think as these reports came out over the last couple of months and especially the last uh, week, um, I think of her and that is, that's my biggest fear. And I never thought that that would be my biggest fear for my child going away to college is fearing for her safety from, um, sexual assault or, um, sexual harassment. But I think about that every day that she is away and I'm so thankful she's here right me, with me today and she has no car to leave my house, <laughs> but I can't keep her locked up forever. But that's what I think of. And that's what makes me so angry. And I look at these students back here and they're nodding their heads. And uh, I'm, I know that we're going to give them a chance to speak, but my confidence in LSU has not grown over the last couple of hours or last 30 minutes. And I don't know if the confidence in your students is any better because this report has come out and now y'all you're going to implement 18 recommendations, the Office of Civil Rights. Um, I'm just so disheartened. And where is the justice for the victims? Do, do, you, do you as students feel like the response that you've received from the university just with these employees, do you feel confident again in your university? I don't. And that makes me so sad because this is my alma mater. I'm so proud of LSU, but we have a huge problem here. And I appreciate that. And, and further, let me just say, I know that you guys were not here during that time. You were new to this. And, and sometimes my, my, my husband and my daughter fuss at me because I seem to be fussing at you and it's not, you weren't here. This is, but unfortunately, you're now having to deal with this. I appreciate, and I think that it was Mr. DeQueer's, um, at Mr. DeQueer's request that uh, that y'all hired the Hush Blackwell firm to come in and do an independent audit. Because I think what happened before, if I'm not mistaken, was you had someone, a, a firm, do an audit that you were already paying to do other work for you. So it was the fox in the hen house. So of course they're going to say whatever you want to say, um, want them to say. So I appreciate that 
you have hired this firm. I couldn't get through the whole report. Um, it, it just, it, it makes me sick that we are here today because we shouldn't have to be here um, if LSU had done their job. And to say that there was a policy not in place or people didn't know what to do, I just think it's kind of bull. Sorry, I'm gonna call it for what it is. It's just bull. These were top administrators and people that know. If I am sexually harassed or sexually abused here at the Capitol, I may not know exactly what the policy says in the handbook, but I know to go to the Speaker of the House, or I know to go to Human Resources. I know where to go. And to, su to suggest that these people, these administrators, and these people that, these are people that these kids looked up to um, and thought that they could go to to protect them, and they failed them. And really, they failed the whole state. Louise, LSU is our flagship university. We are so proud of LSU. But you failed us. And I just, I, I can't get over the immense disappointment and sadness that I feel right now for our state as a whole, but especially for your students and these victims. I just feel so sad. And I look forward to hearing from them. And they are extremely brave for coming forward extremely brave. I cannot even imagine the trauma that they have gone through with the assault itself or the harassment itself, but then for the university to not protect them. I cannot imagine. So I applaud them for coming here today. Um, I have a question about, you mentioned in one of the 18 recommendations, um, you're gonna have an appeal to the Title IX coordinator is this the same person that didn't protect them to begin with? Well, the, the Title IX coordinator is actually the last step in the process. Okay. When the complaint comes in, it mm -hmm. goes to an investigator. Mm -hmm. It's not handled by the, directly by the Title IX coordinator. It goes to an investigator. The investigator then interviews the witnesses, reviews documents, may ask for text messages, emails. The investigator writes an investigatory report, and then it goes to the hearing panel. The hearing panel are, is generally three people with an administrative law judge in the middle. The hearing panel conducts the due process hearing and makes the disciplinary recommendation. It would be at the after that, if either party disagrees with the outcome, then it would be appealed to the Title IX coordinator. So that would be her first step in this process. Okay, and that's someone different than this person that is currently suspended. The yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. The, that was we, I was confused when yeah, you mentioned. Yeah. One of the when when the president talked about convoluted, and I, I don't know if it was clear. One of the issues was athletics has a Title IX equity person for equity in NCAA intercollegiate athletics. That person's responsible for making sure men's and women's teams are treated equally and there's equal participation among men and women on campus. That person's job arises out of Title IX. Yeah. So when you hear Title IX, student athletes would think, oh, this is the Title IX person. That person has zero responsibility with respect to sexual harassment response mm -hmm. or Title IX in terms of harassment that's the campus Title IX coordinator. And one of the things that's been highlighted now in, a, in this report, and it was highlighted in a prior report, is just the nomenclature was causing confusion in reporting. You know, folks felt they were going to Title IX when they were going to the equity officer in athletics, as opposed to the person responsible for sexual Who harassment. felt confused when reporting? Are you talking about administrators? Are you talking about faculty? I think everybody. Yeah. Th this is just an. I just don't understand where the confusion comes from. If I am a, if if I am a faculty member and I go to the president or to the general counsel or, and and you're not the right person, then send me to the right person. Yes. So because they were getting reported somewhere, correct? Some the, are, some aren't. Well, the cases in the in the uh, yeah. in the media were getting reported and they were just kind of being swept under the rug from what I'm understanding. Or, or misdirected. It, or misdirected. Mis okay, misdirected. but it, 
I, I just want us to all be um, honest here in that it was a major screw up. Big time. Yes. Major screw up on LSU's part. Yes. And again, we have to instill confidence back into our kids and back into the public, back into those parents who send their, are going to send their kids to LSU to know that their daughter and son or son is going to be safe when they leave home. Um, and I'm not sure you're doing that right now. Well, I, I, I appreciate that. And I, like you, I totally think that the survivors who have come today are showing incredible bravery. Mm -hmm. um, and we, it's our job now to earn their trust Correct. And, and to earn your trust. Uh, I will disagree that this, this is, this is in, not significant. I think the Hush Blackwell report and effort is true is very significant but but it's 150 pages of words so what will be more significant are not the words Correct. but the actions and, that we and take. i'm not i don't think i said that the hush black world report was insignificant I, and if i did i did not mean i didn't that. but I okay mean, we we i'm i guess what it I, is absolutely significant because yeah. it shed light on what was occurring because um but but i i get i get what you're saying but actions speak louder than words and but again, to, to uh, Ms. Barber's point and uh, Senator Peterson's point, um, the actions that have occurred since the report came out regarding employees, you know, does the punishment fit the crime? I, 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 I don't think I agree with you there. And I, I, I appreciate that. And I think, I think people could definitely disagree. And I would think Mary used the perfect word, which sure. is conflicted. I think, sure. I think all of us feel conflicted on that. I think that our students are going to see this as a slap on the wrist. Well, it's simple. And they're, they're, they're nodding back I see, there. I see that. Yeah. Well, I'm. So what are the, you know, as, as a mom, again, and most of us up here are parents or you have nieces and nephews, we, we talk about consequences and how do I get my child to not do this again? And when you see your, the university then telling a, a, a faculty member up, uh, you get 30 days suspension, slap on the wrist, then you can come back. Again, what confidence do I have as a student to go and report again? No, I, I, I understand what I, you're I, saying. I, I would just urge them all, I would urge every victim to please report. Please report and it, it will be taken very seriously. Everyone will be investigated. But I, I, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Davis. Maybe you could reconsider President Galligan, your decision. Chair, I, I feel, I, I, maybe I could reconsider, but I, mm. I still feel I have an obligation to be fair to everyone involved. So, but thank fair. you. Fair, okay. We're not, I'm, the, I'm just not gonna even go down that road. Representative Freeman, because I, mm -hmm. I would um, like to reiterate um, well, President Galligan. Hold up for one second, uh, Representative Freeman. Point of, point of order, Madam Chair. Can Senator you, Peterson. Yeah, part of, point of order, Madam Chair. Can the committee members pass a resolution in the committee? I know we're a select committee and we're not a standing committee, but do we have the ability before we leave? Because I want to get something drafted. Let me double check. Okay, I think we do have the ability to do that. I, I think we can. I just wonder if we yeah. have enough members And I think present. we might need to consider passing a resolution so that we can formalize where we stand because I feel powerless right now. And you're conflicted, and I feel powerless. And frustrated. And I'll, and I'll put it in writing. We'll, I'm, I'm working on that. Okay. We're going to check on it right now. I'm sorry. Um, Representative Freeman. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I, it's hard for me to repeat what everybody's said already, and I'm going to try my best to focus on where I can, but I, I feel a lot of the same emotions as my colleagues up here. Um, I do have a daughter at LSU. She's a junior. And she told me before I came here, I had dinner with her last night, and she said, oh, it's nothing's going to happen. Everybody knows that LSU is not going to do anything. She has two more years left. I mean, a semester, uh, this semester and two more, three more semesters. 
That is very disheartening to hear your own child tell you how disappointed they are. And she loved being at LSU in the beginning, but she's like, oh, mom, we know nothing's going to happen. So I had a survivor tweet me and ask me, why was this person suspended for 30 days instead of being fired? Your survivors are asking that question. So for, for you to say it's conflicting yeah. is absolutely abhorrent. That's not a $10 word, I guess, but or 10 cent word, that's a $10 word. <laughs> I, I mean, I can't even imagine. I'm not an attorney. I'm glad I'm not an attorney, but I have been an employer and employed by others. I understand what an at-will employee is because I've had to hire and fire and I've been hired. I know when I'm hired that I'm an at-will. So I don't understand as, as, as a businesswoman why this person is still in persons. I don't know if it's just one person that I keep hearing about or persons are still employed there when the truth was not being told. I'm the mom of four kids. My husband and I have always led with the, in the Freeman house, we tell the truth, even when it's not right, or even when we don't feel good about it, what we have to say. In the Freeman house, we come back into this table and we talk to each other about what we really know and how we're gonna be honest in our, in our life and in our work. So to say that you're conflicted is a direct insult to the survivors of sexual assault and harassment and to the students of LSU. And that is the only way I can say it, President Galligan. And I understand that you weren't there when it was happening. I understand that the Board of Supervisors, Ms. Werner, were involved at whatever level where you didn't know the detail. But you are damaging your relationship with your alums. And I'm not an alum, but I have many cousins who are and friends who are. My father is a graduate of the med school. I mean, I have a family member directly. To say that you're conflicted is a direct insult to all of those people. So I, I, I feel like LSU is in what I'd call, and I'm not an attorney, but it's like an organized crime ring that was being run. And we now know what was happening, and we're still covering things up by saying we're conflicted. Insulting, insulting, and abhorrent. Well, Representative Freeman, I certainly do not mean to insult, so I apologize if the word conflicting is insulting to anyone at all. So I, I, offer, my, I offer my apology for that to you and to the students and to, to, the, LS, to the LSU community. I, I would say, though, for as long as I'm in this chair, we're, we're not covering up. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate those words and actions always mean more than words as, as we discussed earlier. The other question I had very specifically, because this is about the students and there's what, 55,000 students in the system. I went on that Title IX website. Um, I understand there's confusion about what to do, but what number are students supposed to call? Because I didn't see any phone number or 24 seven. And then I actually went and looked up what ethics point is and I got questions about what's ethics point and are they some company out of Arizona that we're, you know, using, I don't know where they are, but you know, this is like, you know, it's gotta be, students need to know how to do this. We talked earlier about this um, when one of the other systems was up in front of us. Students already have organizations all around campus. Like how are you getting this information to them so they're comfortable knowing where to go? Because, I mean, I, I can tell you from my daughter's experience, even before this Hutch Blackwell and all that, they don't know. They, and in your reports, your surveys, even though they're small numbers of respondents, say they go to their peers because they don't know. So you're not communicating with them about where they go. And, I, you know, that's just wrong. So I, I'd like to know, maybe y'all can put, you know, while you're testifying, give the phone number, give the website, tell students where they can go. Because... It's just not right that they don't have that information going forward. They should, it should be very blatant. It should be somewhere on the front page. Like if you have a problem, this is who you call. Yeah. It's 24 seven open. Yeah, I, I agree. It can also be, you can also report on the web page, not just the 800 number, but it has to be clear. Can you answer any questions about ethics point and what it does? Uh, Winston, I think, yeah. can. Um, yeah, ethics point is a service that LSU contracted with, um, I, I wanna say maybe two or three years ago, 
basically to provide a 24-hour hotline for employee and student complaints. It, it, it's, it's basically an answering service. And their responsibility is to take calls after hours and then create an email and send it to the appropriate department on campus so that we can capture those phone calls. As for Title IX reporting, um, at the top of the Title IX page, there should be a button that says student report here and you click the button and it has the information to complete a report. Um, if it's not there, I'll, I'll, I'm not gonna be happy, but uh, we, we really I, I work think, I think you should check it, at least I'm looking at it on my phone, so it, it could be differently on the computer. It has a lot of different boxes on here. I don't see it at the very top, at least not on my phone. Yeah. Um, There's a it link. It says so maybe. Office of the Title IX Coordinator, and the very first button is follow report students. The second button is follow report employees. Okay, I might be at a different page than you are then. So. Okay. Um, but, but students should we, know where that page is. Yeah, yeah, and we, we publish that information. When I say publish, that information is included in the student Title IX training and the employee Title IX training. And then periodically, obviously, it's posted around campus, and periodically it's included in emails from strategic communications. So that, that's how we promulgate the avenues. Um, and, and we've really been working hard to increase the visibility of those avenues. I know the Title IX website's undergoing a complete revision as we speak. Um, we revised it this summer following the, uh, the Title IX revisions from the Trump administration. So we've really worked hard to try to capture, capture students that have complaints directly. And our numbers indicate that we are capturing the ones that come through the website and the ones that call. We, we haven't had a lot of complaints about the website or the phone calls. Where we're finding problems, and, and, and this has been an inherent problem in the university, is, is the, the informal, what I call an informal complaint made to just an employee. And we mandate that every employee has a responsibility to report to Title IX, but to give you a real life example, you know, a lot of these are conversations between a student athlete and a trainer about the student athlete's roommate's reaction to something that happened the night before and the trainer having to make a decision in real time, is this the student athlete making a complaint or is this the student athlete sharing something just casually about her roommate or is this something I need to run down the hall to Lighthouse and, and that's, that's been, a, it should not be a problem, but that type of situation has been a problem on our campus. And so is the training being updated so that that yes. trainer now knows yes. that, that he needs to run down the hall to yes, Lighthouse? It, it, I did yes. read about Lighthouse in this report. Yeah, or that trainer needs to go directly to Title IX more appropriately and let Title IX determine what support services need to be um, Okay, as far as ethics points go, if someone calls and it's a sexual assault, um, you said they write an email. Or, I mean, someone's going to need more immediate attention than an email at 3 in the morning. So what, so what do they do to get that person to law enforcement or somebody on campus um, the, that can be helpful to the person? It would be, it would be the Title IX coordinator that would... Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. That would respond to that person. Unfortunately, it would probably be the next morning. If it, if that's it, unacceptable. It, okay. I mean, as Senator Mizell said, these things don't often happen at three o'clock in the afternoon. So whatever changes are being made, if someone calls at three in the morning or four in the morning, whatever, someone needs to be available. There's 55,000 students at LSU. You should figure out a way to make sure there's somebody available to help that student at that time. And, and I don't think there are any instances, Representative Freeman, of somebody using t ethics point to report this is happening now. There are, there, are, there are police available, there are mental health resources available, and there are other resources available to, to address the crisis as it occurs. Okay, but, so at least I agree. if somebody did use that number, shouldn't they know yes. to direct them to that mental health person who is on call or on duty? Yes, or don't report an emergency here.
Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Representative Freeman. Uh, Representative Marcel. Uh, good afternoon. Or is it evening? I've been here all day. I don't know how to start unbagging all of this. I've been sitting here uh, listening, and one word keeps coming up that's really bawling everybody up here. It says conflicting. Um, when something is conflicting, you, you just you don't know what to do. You, you don't know how to take it. What's not conflicting for me is Title IX. Although I'm hearing you say, I'm talking to President Gallagher, that there were no true lines of, 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 of reporting and, and they were even giving it to the equity officer, the, that Title IX officer. This, we're talking about LSU, the flagship university. Am I correct? Higher institution of learning. Yes. Am I correct? Absolutely. And so what you are telling this committee and this body today is that there are instructors and administrators and staff people that don't know when to report a sexual harassment or a sexual, sexual misconduct to anyone to get, a, get it up to the chain. Is that, that's kind of what we're hearing. And so we're talking about an institution of higher learning that we have instructors that don't know how to report these claims. Is that what you want us to believe today? I think today they know how to make those claims. I think they did not know how to make those claims or whether they should make those claims in, in, in recent history. I, I'm not conflicted at all on their absolute obligation to make those claims, and I believe they understand that now. I think we've, re, re, we've reiterated that repeatedly, in really since, since the fall semester began. I, I don't think there was ever, or it should not have been any person on campus that was an employee that did not understand what Title IX is and what it does. I, I, I mean, this, this shuffling about where they should have reported, whether they didn't report it, many of these incidents were reported to the Title IX officer. Is that right? And, and why wasn't that dealt with? I mean, we're, we're skipping and hopping all around the place, and we're protecting whomever we're protecting, and then we start to call the Title IX officer person a volunteer, right? I heard somebody say they were just volunteer. Yes, I did. Some and of the investigators, bef before, before we hired a full-time investigator in 2018, the investigators were volunteer. They were employees who also volunteered to investigate Title IX. Matters. Let me stop you right there. Yes. So if I volunteer to do something at the Capitol. They're gonna first tell me what it is I'm volunteering to do. I should know that if I'm volunteering it, right? So they're gonna give me instructions. Representative Marcel, we need you to do this report or check this, or, right? Mm -hmm. So you just telling me you had a random instructors. No, we, that had, we had a group of investigators who were our own employees who had other duties. Those people were trained. What were they? Let, let, let's, they, were, what, they, were, they, were, they were faculty, they were staff. They that's, were, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Some of them may have been instructors, right? Correct. Okay, that's, you, you're acting like they weren't instructors. That's why I'm, no, I'm, some I'm using Some of them were instructors. Some of them were instructors. Yeah. So they're smart enough to instruct students to get a college degree, but they're not smart enough if somebody to investigate something, to get it to the proper place. That's what you want us to believe. No, I don't want you to believe that. I don't think the investigators, I, I have no qualms that the investigators knew what they were doing, but we've got, we've got thousands of employees, and the investigators were a very small group of employees on the Baton Rouge campus. They were, they were basically experts 
in Title IX investigations to the extent that you could be an expert as a, as a volunteer who is trained. It's the, it's the, it's the other folks. And I, I what who I believe. Identify who the other folks are. I think various fa that. faculty, staff, and, and, and um, instructors who did not all understand what their obligation was under Title IX. And, and I, don't, I don't want you to believe that, but that's what the Hush Blackwell report concluded. Okay, so let me ask another crazy question. You, you guys talk about ethics point. How long ago did you all have that system in place, uh, President Gallica? Do you know? I, I believe that was set up two to three years ago. Two to three years ago. So they didn't get any, any complaints that uh, were shifted to the wrong place? Or what happened with those complaints? Were there any complaints? I, I'm not aware of complaints shipped to the wrong place. I know when Ethics Point, and, and this is just doing some research as part of this process, when Ethics Point was originally set up, the reason it's titled Ethics Point is it was set up to receive anonymous complaints regarding employee misconduct. It was very popular, and we needed a system for students, and we actually... From when did I'm, we integrate it into well, the sexual well, assault? That's my question. Yeah, from what I'm told, it would collect a handful of misguided complaints from students, and they decided it would be worthwhile just to expand it to students so we could have one 1-800 number for campus complaints instead of different 1-800 numbers. And so... so Okay, so it was eventually expanded to basically be the after hours reporting service for the system. Okay, well I'm I'm just like my colleagues up here and it's mind boggling for me um that we start to talk about a fresh start. Mm -hmm. I know that you guys are new. I get that. But when you start talking about a fresh start, that means that we're gonna start over. But what about the victims? What kind of start are they getting? I'm just wondering in my little bitty mind up here what fresh start would mean for them. It means for you, let's move on and going forward, we'll do this. But what does it mean for the victim? A fresh start for them would be that some consequences happen that or related to what happened to them and what did not happen and what should have happened as it relates to Title IX, as it relates to the complaints that they filed, a fresh start, and I don't want to speak for them because we're going to hear from them, and I'm going to stay right here until I hear from every one of them. But I can't imagine that they would think that it was a fresh start for them. I just can't imagine it. And I know you were put in a conflicting position or in a tough spot but I just think the whole thing is disheartening and you know I'm just appalled at, at the entire report and how it's been handled and and I want to thank the one of the two women board members and we need to address that how many board members is it Let's talk about that for a 16. second. 16. It's 16, and we can only find two women that are credible to serve on that. That's to Mr. Governor. That's our governor. Okay. Just thought I'd share that with y'all while we was on the subject of women and leadership, because we do need them in places so that they can speak up. You see who showed up today out of 16, ma'am? Oh, it was a woman. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here. Well, Representative Marcel, I, I, I wish to God that I could do whatever I could do to give, give those survivors a fresh start. And I, the only thing I'm conflicted, when I use the word conflicted, about is, was the punishment. And really, let's get down to it, is whether or not someone should have been fired. And that's my only conflict on this. The, the, the and you are aware that in other institutions when similar things happen, that they did fire the people like really quick. Are you aware of that? I'm aware some have and some have. Like in Kansas, you ever read that? Did you read it anywhere? Well, I, checking. I, I read it and I wouldn't have read it if this report hadn't existed. All right. Well, uh, I just I just want to you know echo what my, many of my colleagues have said. 
that is disheartening. Uh, it's, I don't think what has happened is fair to the students, and we have an obligation to protect them. And I think we should do a better job. And um, I'm sorry that you came in on this note, but you sat in the hot seat. We, we, and you're responsible for what happens right now. No, we, we, we agree on uh, how we feel about the report. We're devastated by the report. Uh, and you're right. I'm in the hot seat, but that's because I have this role. So, so it's on me. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Marcel. Uh, Representative Edmiston. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm sorry. I just want to go back. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. And I know it's been probably grueling for you, so I'm going to go down a different track. I want to go back. Mary, I I'm sorry I didn't get your last name, but that's okay if you don't mind me calling you Mary. That's fine. Why? You had said something about, um, I think it was you, uh, someone said it took 19 months to hire someone. Who said that? I did. Okay. Can you, uh, can you explain to me why uh, that was, uh, you were trying to hi hire a Title I coordinator or someone under her, he we were, or she rather? Yes. We were trying to hire an investigator. She said, I need an investigator. That gets back to Representative Marcel's questions about the volunteer. We had a this group of volunteer right. investigators. And, and that our, wasn't working. So you needed to hire someone. Exactly. Okay. And it, took, it took 19 months to hire him. Now I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to sound defensive here, but this, this was before it wasn't us who were doing this. Okay. Just, I just, just want to know the process and why it took 19 months. I, I don't know. Okay. I can imagine the answer might have been. Okay. So resources. who who was it up know. to to uh, who who could tell me that? People who are no longer at LSU. Okay, but they were LSU people, not like the federal government or anything like that. LSU. Okay, and it took 19 months. Nobody knows why, but you finally got who you needed. Okay, so you have investigators that are under the Title One. You have one investigator under the Title I. How much money y'all get from uh, from the federal government uh, at, for Title I? Do you get uh, no money? Nothing. Nothing at all? No. In the way of Title IX? No. That's interesting. That's a self, it's a, it's a self-funding, there's a mandate, but we have to fund it. Non-funded mandate. Title, title IX would be like in the employment context, Title VII. Small businesses okay. don't get money from the right. government for complying with the anti-discrimination Yeah, sort of laws. like 504 in the yeah. school system. We, we, no, told, no funding for that. We're told we have to comply, but we don't get funding to help us comply. It's just you have to fulfill these obligations, but there's no funding okay. stream that comes with it. Okay. So, so now we have a Title IX, and you tell me that really when a person files a complaint, they really don't see the Title IX person, who is the person that's really in the know, until the third level. They have an informal investigation, a formal, uh, maybe not investigation, but informal, then formal. Then if it goes that far, they, they see the Title IX. Yeah, I wouldn't call it informal or formal. It's when they file the complaint, okay. the investigator's assigned, and we have one investigator. He meets with the complainant. He then gathers all the information. He will interview witnesses. He will review documents. He will request emails and text messages. Then he prepares a report that's given to a panel to conduct a hearing. And the hearing is a typical due process hearing on whether an individual has violated Title IX or not. And so what the investigator does is basically gather all the facts and then gives it to a hearing panel where three people, the middle of which is an administrative law judge, will conduct a hearing. The other two people on the panel? Are usually faculty or staff. They have been trained? Yes. Yes, they have to go. I think now it's I'm sure y'all have beefed up your training. Yeah, well, and after the day, you're really going to beef up your training. <laughs> yes. But, um, and there's also there are also other resources available. So, for instance, Lighthouse, uh, Representative Freeman, we mentioned Lighthouse. Lighthouse is is a survivor support um, center in our in our health center. And and I, I am proud to say that I know we we disagree on 
on the penalty phase, and we disagree with the students. On, we've talked about that, but I think we'd all agree that Lighthouse, Lighthouse is, is doing strength. a good job. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Who Hush funds Black Lighthouse? Says y'all do. We do. Okay. It, is one investigator enough? No. Absolutely. Okay. So, uh, have there been any? Uh, is there been any talk or any plans to hire more than one investigator? Yes. The Office of Civil Rights in Title IX which will be Title IX, Title VII, ADA, and other discrimination. Okay. We'll have, we'll hire, we're, we're, the plans are to hire support for the office. There's no administrative support currently for the Title IX effort. Okay. A, a case manager, in other words, somebody who t keeps track of where things are in the process so that when Is that a case a manager for the, for the alleged victim? It's a case it's manager for the file, for, for, the, for the case. Okay. And though also we will hire, we'll hire investigators. So we'll add to our staff of investigators. I think Hush Blackwell recommended that we add two, at least two investigators. So two more investigators and a case manager for the file, not for the, not for the victim. And an administrative support staff. And we'll also designate a deputy coordinator for Title IX services and resources. And our goal in doing that is going to be to link the process, the Title IX process and office, even more manifestly to Lighthouse. Lighthouse, Susan Boreas, who, who is in charge of Lighthouse, is an incredible resource for, for the university and mm -hmm. the state. What, what, if someone goes to Lighthouse, Susan, as a confidential advisor, can tell the survivor what their options are, um, the, the police, Title IX, the other options that, that they may have so, right. so that the survivor gets to decide what the survivor wants to do. Okay, I beg your pardon. So survivor is the term I should be using. Okay, not victim. Um, so who, prior to all of this, who was giving those resources to the survivor? Lighthouse has existed for, Lighthouse has existed for a good while. And every survivor was referred to Lighthouse? No. 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 A survivor has a choice of where they want to go, but what we need to do, and we're doing this, is making Lighthouse, Lighthouse, right? Like if something happens to you, that's what you see is Lighthouse, because at least by my way of thinking from what I've learned in the past couple months is that's the best first place to go. Because it's also got health resources, mental health resources, because you're right there in the building in the health center, and an and, and, and informed, compassionate, sensitive person who can explain your options to which, you. Which is what, it, it sounds like to me just from listening to all of this, that, that that what you just identified seems like it's what's been missing for the survivor. It's like they got the raw end of the deal all the way around, and I'm not going to belabor everything that my colleagues have said, but, but do you understand what, where we're coming from? We feel like th they're the ones that have really gotten, gotten the shaft, so to speak. It, one thing we've learned out of this is Title IX's presence and the responsibilities and the duties is something that you've not done a good job, not done a good job at all, of explaining to, I'm going to say, your faculty, your student population, the parents who pay the money for the kids to go to school. I mean, it's just not, not been good. So obviously you're gonna beef up your PR campaign for P Title IX and what it does. We're, we're, I mean, we're, I, I would recommend you do that. We're not only gonna beef up our PR campaign, we're gonna invest significantly in the resources we need to do this right. Will that be uh, something that will raise student tuition? That does not seem fair, right? We'll have to find this. No, it does not seem fair. <laughs> yeah, we hope that we don't no. see that. Yeah, okay, good, good. Thank you so much. I'm not raising tuition. Very good point, Representative uh, Edmondson. Uh, Representative Landry. Thank you. Um, I apologize if I asked something that was asked earlier. I was on a phone call. And so my understanding is, is y'all are both really new in your roles and that when you answer questions, it's either based on, on knowledge you've gained or on uh, an expectation moving forward. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, okay. So I asked this question earlier of Mr. Henderson, but are you aware of any, uh, any risk that federal funds may be withheld from 
the LSU system because of noncompliance with Title IX? We, we, we're definitely aware of the risk. That, that, that's, that's always a risk and a concern, yes. Is there any sort of open investigation by the federal government right now? There's a Cleary Act. You can probably answer this much more clearly than I can, but there's a Cleary Act inquiry into whether or not we've reported under the Cleary Act. Okay. Is there any, any time frame or estimate for that? We actually just held, it's a Cleary off-site audit. We just held our opening conference, and they're hoping to conclude it within this year. But, but within, be a while. But, but it's United States Department of Education. Mm -hmm. They did tell us they're transitioning staff right now because of the change in the administration. So um, we're expecting probably 10 to 16 months. OK. Um, to the extent you can answer this question, are there any civil lawsuits pending against the university right now because of recent noncompliance with Title IX? We have one claim, and it's not because of, well, I'm, I'm as the lawyer. I'll say just related to anything we're discussing today. We have one unique Title IX claim, and that's the Max Groover case. Um, I don't know if y'all recall, Max Groover was the young man who died after a hazing. pledge incident, hazing, hazing incident. The nature, one of the claims his lawyer made is that we have, we've had a disparate enforcement of hazing rules on sororities as opposed to fraternities, and they filed it in federal court as a Title IX claim. So, so that, that's actually our, our pending Title IX lawsuit. But there are no other um, private suits that you're aware of? No, not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. Um, something I'm a little curious about, I know there's been a lot of discussion about um, from the report that there wasn't enough staff, there wasn't, you know, basically enough resources. Um, who or, or what group of people decided that? Like if, if, if someone, I don't remember all the names, there's so many in here, went and said, I need more staff, who would that person have gone to? Well, in the report, the I know this, the Title IX coordinator reports to me, so in that section of the report, I was paid particularly close attention. She had made a presentation, I believe it was to the general counsel and the president, about what she thought an appropriate staff would be. When she made that presentation, she was the only person in the Title IX office because they had just begun to build out the office. And so she was saying, as we build out the office, this is what I think an appropriate staffing was look like. I believe that was 2016. About five years ago, right. And so have there not been any requests to the extent you know for, for more staff since then? Because they seem wildly understaffed. We, 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 we actually, um, and the president may remember this, we had a discussion about staffing, and, and it, it was... You have to understand, I started in February, the president started in January, and in March we went remote for the next six months. So assessing staffing, mm -hmm. you know, after my first four weeks in office was difficult, but in the middle of revamping for the new Title IX regulations, we did have a discussion about it was really hard for two people to review 2,000 pages of new regulations and do what they needed to do in Title IX, and I actually took myself and another full-time lawyer to assist Title IX in revamping our processes for the new regulations. And we were talking about we have to add more Title IX staff. So we, we talked about it this summer. I mean, I'm sure you all must be aware that other schools have, in, Tulane, for example, have entire offices. And, and obviously there's different financial situations and, and different sizes and that sort of thing. But when I saw that there was one investigator for yes. this many students, I mean, that's, yeah. that's just not possible to happen. We were aware of that, yes. Mm -hmm. But your predecessors, were they aware? I, 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 I'm not, Again, I, yeah, to the extent I know, you know. I don't know. I can tell you just based on a handful of, con not a handful, based on conversations, the few conversations I've had with folks within my office, the concept of the Title IX coordinator being in the general counsel's office was never intended to be a permanent solution. It was a stopgap solution for creating the office because they could easily lean on 
the attorneys in the office for support, but it was always the expectation it would be built out in its own office, and it just never occurred. It didn't happen, right. Um, I want to switch a little bit. So this report from Morgan and Lewis, was that 17? 19. 19. It was the fall of 2019. 2019, so that was before y'all were there, right? Who requested that? My understanding is the prior general counsel requested that report. Okay. Um, do you do you know much around the circumstances that led the, to the request? A, a little bit, yes. Could you describe yes. it for us? Um, there were actually some concerns about the student athlete who had, at the time, her father had retained a lawyer, uh, a local, a prominent local lawyer, to potentially pursue a claim against the school. And my understanding is he reached out to Morgan Lewis to do a couple of things. One, evaluate the athletics department's understanding of their Title IX obligations and whether they needed some help in complying. The second part was to evaluate potential exposure from the student athlete because he had become aware her father had retained a lawyer. So the Morgan Lewis wasn't a complete analysis. No, it was, no, it was no. more specific. Yeah, it, it was, my understanding is it was a targeted evaluation by the general counsel, one, to assess problems, and two, to assess a liability. Some of the same problems that were, are in the Hush Blackwell report, some of the same cases. Were found, were discussed in Morgan, the Morgan Lewis report. They're not discussed in the report. The report discusses no cases at all. The report just makes general recommendations, and the report was not shared. We learned of the report. The two of us learned of the report pursuant to a records request in this investigation. This is kind of leading to my next round of questions. I would like to see that report. Has it been released? No, that, that report has not been released. Is it under any sort of privilege? The, the perp Ish. What, what we've learned is that the reason it was originally requested was by an attorney for the university to assess a potential liability for the university. Um, so much of it was made available through Hush Blackwell. We can reconsider whether we want to consider it attorney-client privilege. Yeah. Okay. So it was, it was requested yeah. solely from the general counsel's yeah. office? Yeah. At, okay. at the time, which is something, you know, at the time the Morgan Lewis report was requested, a lot of these claims were early within their prescriptive period, and he was dealing with the potential for lawsuits. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, does Taylor Porter still work for your office? Yes. Okay. That's a whole other discussion. <laughs> whole other discussion. Um, I think I just want to end on, and I'm not sure how, how or why or where this came up, but these emails on page 50 about Coach Miles um, were the most disturbing part of this report to me that so many people knew exactly what was going on and put it in writing, which was what I couldn't believe that this was put in writing back in th 2013 and we're just finding out about it now in 2021 and echoing Rep. Freeman and, and Senator Peterson about the Catholic Church. I am extremely concerned about the amount of people he has potentially harmed since then. And I hope that whatever y'all are doing now and whatever Kansas is doing um, is taking that into account, to, not just from a legal perspective, but just ethically as well. Representative Landry, if I could add something. Um, one of the things, and in, in I know you guys have Scott Schneider from Hush Blackwell on the phone to answer some questions that we did is that's very different from any investigation that we know of that was done before LSU I mean done before at LSU is we left no stone unturned and not only did we leave no stone unturned when we uncovered some stuff we shared it with our outside investigators the reason you see stuff like this is because we spent a lot of time with IT data mining Finding emails things. I mean mm -hmm. Data mining an email from 2013 is not an easy. I know. You know, I, I know. For a former, which is why it was surprising. For a former employee who's been gone for two or three years, um, it took some work to find this stuff, and we asked people to work really hard to find it. We recreated a lot of email accounts that had been long since disbanded. 
Um, we did a lot of work to share a lot of stuff that has never been shared before, which is why you see these emails. And if you read the whole report, you'll see a lot of references to a lot of documents no one's ever seen. I got pretty far through it yesterday. Um, and, and that actually, you know, it does look like from my perspective that a lot has happened in the last year to uncover it. And that's, I guess, what is concerning that in, in 13 here and then the Morgan Lewis report strongly suggests that a lot of people knew, not even just suggest, said that they knew that a lot was going on. And I'm just concerned if they're, if some of those people are still at the university and um, what's going to happen to them. I guess y'all be back here telling us that at some point. And, and I'm going to sound defensive again, but none of the three of us had any awareness at all about any of these emails or the 2013 matter or the investigation at all. We literally, I think the 2013 stuff we learned about less than five, six weeks ago. Um, sorry, so this was, that was my last question, but this will be my last question. Are, is there currently a process to determine if, if anyone, for example, involved in the 2013 incident or anything investigated in 2017, are y'all currently looking to see if anyone who might be responsible for that is still at the university? We are looking. And at that's that. ongoing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Landry. Uh, Representative Marcel. Thank you. What I forgot to do was to thank you, Senator Barrow, for having this committee and for uh, bringing uh, not only LSU but all the universities across the state here to to because we need to hear this and we need to know what's going on. And I want to thank you guys for making the, the report public. Uh, but I do have one question that I forgot to ask. Uh, is anyone aware of another hearing on this issue uh, at LSU, maybe at the House Education Committee, I'm not, I don't serve on that, or Senate, or appropriations, where y'all might need some money, where I sit, to, to create some more positions uh, that y'all need. Oh, has anyone, no no one, no one but Senator Barrow thought it was important? I was just well, wondering. I well, think it should go before the Education Committee, on one of these sides, House, Senate, both. We've, cert we've certainly tried to keep the, the chairs of those committees in, informed as to what was going on, and I'm, I'm, sh I'm, sure they'll, I'm sure they'll be interested, and I'm sure they'll ask us questions. I'm not aware of any set hearing as of right now. I, I wasn't either, and that's why I, I was asking on the record, because I think there should be. I think there should be in here, at least in education, absolutely in education. Okay, and I'm, I'm on appropriations if y'all need some money to find for another position. I'll see what I can do to help you guys, thank, all right? Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. Senator Peterson, thank you, Representative Marcel. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. And I do want to thank you too, Sen uh, Representative Marcel is bringing up a good point. This is a select committee that you chair, Madam Chair, and it is not one of the standing the, um, committees that has jurisdiction and oversight, mm -hmm. right? And right. so, um, I think it's really important for something. It's our flagship. It's our flagship. And there's a lack of trust in our flagship. Let's cut to the chase again. Mm -hmm. There's a lack of trust today, and there's even more of a lack of trust in, from me. I feel powerless today. And I don't usually, I'm not one who feels powerless. You know that, Winston, huh? I know that. I'm not one of those. <laughs> but I really do. And I think a lot of my colleagues probably feel that way too because we did what we thought we needed to do. We asked the Board of Regents to do something. The Board of Regents helped us to design a uni uniform policy. And then we um, didn't know some things and there wasn't the best policy in place. And you don't want to be retroactive is what I'm hearing. You don't want to have retroactive enforcement. Is that why you're conflicted, Mr. President? That's why I'm conflicted. And when you were out of the room, I said the only thing I'm conflicted about is, is and that I've been conflicted about, is the appropriate discipline should we fire somebody. That's the only thing I'm conflicted about. Do you have a daughter? I have uh, two, three. I had three daughters. One passed away from cancer. I'm sorry. About um, that. Yeah. Well, Senator, thank you very much. And, and I, I'll tell you, this feels a little bit like that. Um, so this hurts. So 
I do have three daughters. I have a son and uh, I have a grandson um, who's just a year old and I haven't seen him since he was a week old. So I'm looking forward to getting up and visiting him. But I, wor I, I, I hear where you're coming from. And, and I don't know if you do. I do. I want my kids to go to a safe and my grandchildren to be in a safe environment. So, so I appreciate that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just implore you to reconsider your decisions because uh, they matter and the truth matters. And um, if you don't have confidence in the people, you said the leadership, or, or not, no, I think uh, Pres uh, Dr. Henderson said the leadership matters. And if you're going to remain as the president of the flagship university, we have to trust that you're going to make the right decisions that in, in gender trust. I'm not sure if that's happening right now. Well, I, I appreciate that. I, I hear what y'all are saying loud and clear. All right, I have a, another question. Um, well, that was more of a comment. Your insurance policy. Yes. What, how much coverage do you have? For things are, for these kinds of issues on the civil side. Yeah. On the Baton Rouge campus, we are actually self-insured. Hmm. Um, so we so if a whole, whole on, an onslaught of civil cases came, well, who well, would have to pay for it? We, we're self-insured to the first million. To the first we, million. And then we carry an umbrella from one million to 50 million. To 50 million. Okay. And so if it goes beyond 50 million in damages from jury cases who would end up paying for that it would come back to us the lsu system and the lsu system is primarily funded by whom the state who it would be a combination of the state and the students the state and the students i've heard this before so that means in the form of the general fund and or the tuition and fees paid by the students yes. so ultimately it could be that either the state legislature through the appropriations process the budget or the same parents and students that are on the short end of this dick mm. would have to pay the cost of the egregious acts of liars. Yes. Because of the self-insurance policy of a million and then the umbrella one to 50 million. Yes. Yes. That doesn't feel good either. No, no, it doesn't. Yeah. Mm -mm. So those are significant financial, potential financial consequences as well. Um, let me, uh, well, final question is the federal government, you said that the federal government is looking at uh, the, the Title IX. The, well, they're doing what's called a Clery audit. Oh, the Clery audit. Okay. So the Clery audit, does it take into consideration when they look at, when they do the audit, do they take into consideration the enforcement actions that the university has put in place? So whatever action you take, do they consider that in the audit? When you say in for so when they look at what happened and whether or not you were compliant, do they also look at the decision you made, for example, to suspend? The the Clary audit is and, a, and I don't I'm being yeah, clear I don't well, yeah, clear I don't let, understand let, clear. But yeah let me explain the Clary audit is evaluating whether our annual crime statistics reported on our law enforcement website are an accurate reflection. Okay. Of the of the crimes that we received complaints of or should have received complaints of. Okay, it's a snapshot. And and we believe the concern, and it's a it's a very significant concern, is that the fact that certain cases were not being properly reported to the Title IX office means they were not getting properly reported on the annual Clary reports, mm -hmm. and so they're going to compare basically police logs and Title IX complaints with the final reporting numbers and reconcile them and tell us if they believe our reports were accurate. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure the Clary Audit's gonna look at the issue you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, all right, so that's helpful. I'll read about it a little bit more, but yeah, it doesn't, you're, you're absolutely right. It's, but but it's different... there is still, to your question, there is still, and we believe it, it will likely happen, um, there is still the potential for Office of Civil Rights, what we call Title IX enforcement audits. And although we haven't been notified, it would not be uncommon following a report like this to receive a notice that they'd want to spot check various cases for enforcement compliance. Okay. 
Okay, that would come under the Title IX civil rights. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. And okay. that may very well happen. I, I would not be surprised if that I occurs. I hope it does. You're looking at me like that's more work. Yes, <laughs> yes, it needs to happen. It's about accountability. Well. It's okay. We all get held accountable. And then, uh, uh, Madam Former Chair, um, uh, Mary, um, you know, I was really proud to, uh, there's a lot of conversation about me and confirmation processes and yes, why I make decisions, but I was really proud to confirm you. I served as the chair of the committee for four years in the last term, and there were 16 members. I don't remember exactly how many, but the two women that do serve came through the committee, and I know that you um, both are quite competent and capable, and you have led recently as a chair in a bold and courageous way and I've seen progress and I just want to say I'm proud of what you've done and I hope that Denise representative Marcel referenced you know the fact that the governor does have the ability to appoint more women and diversity matters I made a decision recently because of diversity it wasn't gender it was race but diversity matters and when you have you have to be intentional about it and so when I use my power as the senator in, that, in these different roles, because it is powerful, on some, in some, you, we can be intentional about getting people in place that can make decisions, and you are very powerful. And I hope you continue to use that power to influence decisions that impact many, many women on that campus. And we're relying on you. Thank you, Senator. I did. You try to use my power. I know you did. As uh, I hope you all recognize, to make sure our students of color always felt that they were in a safe place. Not students now, of color. All people. I'm not only talking about students I of know, color I, right and now. I was going to say. I'm talking about women right I now. I know we have failed the women, all women, on this campus, and mm. I, and you referenced yeah. I was in a position of power, and I feel that I still am. You are. And we will, uh, Ms. Jones and I will not turn our eye I on know this. you won't. Y'all are strong, and we're counting on you. There's a lot of weight on two women's shoulders. But guess what? You can do it. It just right. takes we one. Can. It just takes fortunately, one. Fortunately, I will say very fortunately, the present company of this administration and our colleagues listen to us, and uh, we have a lot of work to do, and we realize that. I know, and we're proud of you, and yeah. thank you. Thank you, Senator Jackson. Um, thank you, Ms. Warner. Uh, we do have uh, one last question coming from Senator Jackson, who is on the line. Uh, she's been listening in, and so she has a question uh, as well, President Galligan. Senator thank Jackson. Thank you. Can you hear me, Madam Chairperson? Very loud and clear. Well, thank you so much, Madam Chair Lady, for accommodating those members who couldn't be there in person. And I want to make sure that the members who traveled to the Capitol had an opportunity to ask all their questions before I came online uh, out of respect for those who were actually able to attend in person. Mr. President, I'm going to preference my questions with this. Um, I understand that you were not there um, when uh, what we read in the report occurred. So uh, my questions are more moving forward, okay? I listened in on what the plan of action is, and I do have some concern, and I think you're here uh, for our input. Am I, am I correct about that? Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, good deal, and I figured that. My concern is, is what some of the members have stated earlier, uh, is that there should be someone that these young ladies can get in touch with at 3 o'clock at night when they complain. With a campus as large as LSU and what we've seen in this report, I think it's going to be very incumbent upon us and the university and you to stand tall in protecting women at the campus moving ahead. So my strong suggestion would be, number one, that. And my uh, comments are going to be brief because I'm still trying to wrap my head around the entire report of what happened. And I understand that there are multiple tiers to um, it not being properly reported. But we know the Title IX office, as, as many have said, is is the one office who uh, should really have the tools and equipment it needs to protect women on that campus against sexual harassment. So in your upcoming budget, what is the priority to fully fund and staff that Title IX office? 
Yes, yeah, Senator Jackson, we will, we, we would definitely, we're gonna begin, to, we're not gonna wait till the f future budget, we're gonna start now um, with hiring people to work in that office. Um, as I responded already, we, we will, I'm gonna meet with the interim VP tomorrow. Uh, we will probably start with some sort of administrative support and a case manager, and then we'll discuss the best, uh, the, the best philosophy going forward on adding investigators. How many do we add? When do we add them? We'll also be beginning a search for the permanent vice president in, the, in that position. Um, and so, so that will probably happen very soon as well. One could wait till there's a permanent president to do that, but we're not going to wait. We're going to start that. Yeah, and I don't think, I mean, after reading the report, I, I think what you're doing is correct in that because we can't wait. What the report says is that we can't wait to do what's right for our female population on that campus. And my next question is this, and maybe this is more of a forward question, but I think it should be said. I know there's, you know, been comments that previous administrations, you know, although positions were requested, uh, they were not made available. I don't know if it's because of financial reasons, but without going through um, a litany of questions about your budget, I really want to say this. I don't think this should be something that comes to the legislature for funding. When I look at your athletic budgets and other budgets at LSU, I think this is going to come down to a priority issue and uh, properly funding this office with the monies that LSU already has. Senator, I appreciated Representative Marcel's comment that if we wanted funding, but I agree with you, we're, we're, we're going to figure out a way to fund this. All right, and, and, that's, and, and listen, if you come, if, if there's a tight, I understand it, but right now when I look at LSU's budget and what you said today is your commitment and what your board displayed in their last board meeting as a commitment moving forward. I just believe that there's funding at LSU to take care of all this because it and and and, and I'm glad you agree it's a priority issue at this point. You know, and that would fall on the current administration if the prior if it wasn't prioritized to properly uh, staff type your Title IX office. I I agree. And I still yet preference my comments with the fact that you were not there when this occurred, but it's so egregious. Anyone in leadership at this point should want to see it taken care of properly and to prevent any future acts like this of occurring. Yeah, yes, you, Sen Chairperson. Senator, I agree. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, that. I agree. I thought you were waiting for me. I totally agree. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairperson. I just wanted to make sure we understood about priority. Thank you, Senator Jackson, and thank you for your patience, and we appreciate you uh, joining us uh, via phone. And so as we get ready to wrap up, you know, um, someone just asked me, like, what is the budget? Uh, for that position or what would it require for you to properly set up that office? Do y'all know what that number is? I, I would say about it, probably in the range of a million dollars. Okay. Which you guys do have the capacity to do that. We are going to find that million dollars. Mm -hmm. I believe could, that could be, could be a little, could be a little bit more when you think about a vice president's salary and, and, but, but we're going to find, we're going to figure it out and do it. Okay, and, and, and lastly, um, uh, we'll get ready to transition. I, I do want to make this statement um, and make sure that it's real clear for everybody here. Uh, certainly, this is not our first time uh, on this rodeo. It, it is not. A few years ago, we had an issue with the ULL system, um, and I believe that it seemed like they put some protocols in place that may be working, we assume. But I know that according to what um, President Henderson talked about today, sounds like from that where they were a couple years ago, the things that they've implemented are working. But as long as I am the chair of Select Women and Children, I'm going to let everyone know in this audience and that can hear me that we are committed to this and we will not let it go until we have true resolve. The culture that has existed uh, in our state around this issue, we will no longer tolerate it. And my commitment is I will continue to bring everybody back 
and making sure that we'll continue to be updated in terms of what's happening and what's, what things have been uh, transpiring, what things have been enacted. Just make sure that we have the assurance of the things that we have asked for are happening and making sure that those individuals who have been violated have been have gotten some sense of resolve. That is my commitment. Um, because I, I just want to say before they get up, I this will not be something that as a legislator I will allow to be a part of my legacy. When a young person show up for college, they go there so hopeful, bright eye, bushy tail. And many of them have come from small areas, and they go there trusting so many people. And when they end up with someone that they feel they can trust, who is an adult, an administrator, a coach, and they violate that trust, some of them can't recover from that. And so I personally take this really personal, and I give you my commitment that we will not allow this to be water to float under the dam any longer, not in Louisiana. So that's my commitment. I think we're working on something else that we're going to send out after a while as the uh, committee. But I just want everybody here just listening to know my commitment to you, and I promise you we will follow through.